So my name is Ashley McGlone. That's Mr. Ashley McGlone. Uh, I explained that in my session yesterday. It's uh, Mr. So uh, here's my address on uh, TechNet, aka.ms slash GoTPFE on Twitter, GoTPFE. Uh, the slides, the presentation, the uh, scripts that I'm going to use today, I'll post on my blog next week if you want a copy of them. I think they're going to post them here too as well somewhere. You don't have the URL or how do we get them for the other presenters? You don't have that I don't know. Couldn't tell you. Yep. So I've worked for Microsoft. Uh, January makes four years. I've been working for Microsoft, but uh, way before that I started with a Commodore in 1982. So I've been doing PC kind of stuff all my life. Uh, so this is my dog. His name's Copper. I figure since this is dog food conference, everybody else is putting their dogs in their slides, I can give you a chance to look at mine. I figured Get Dash Squirrel would be a good uh, PowerShell command it for my beagle. Yeah, he, he's almost got one one time. All right, so this is a really important quote for us. It's going to kind of guide us for the rest of the, the session today. Give a man a script, feed him for a get date. Teach a man a script, feed him for a new dash time span. Would you believe that Lao Tzu, a new PowerShell, 4th century BC? I wouldn't believe that either, but it really works for the slide. This is really what I want to do in this session today. I was writing some code for a customer several months ago, and I thought, you know, this process that I'm doing is I'm discovering which commandlets to use and what properties and methods I need and that whole scripting process. We don't really teach the process of scripting. We teach about commandlets and we teach about different techniques, but we don't really teach what goes on in the head of a scripter. You know, if, if I'm going to do something besides just copying and pasting a script from the Internet, what really goes into writing that script and that process? And that's what we're going to talk about today. So I want to teach how to script. And this is designed to be a 100 to 200 level session for beginner PowerShell scripters. And I want you to go from being a copy and paste scripter, because that's where we all start, to an I can do this scripter. Okay? And when I teach PowerShell, I usually tell folks that it's, like, it's kind of like playing the guitar. For the first six months, your fingers really hurt. You know, it takes a little bit to get over the hump of learning PowerShell and getting familiar with the syntax. But one day, this light bulb is going to go off in your head and say, hey, this, this kind of looks familiar to me now. It's starting to work. And you start to get some confidence the more practice you get with it. So I want to take you to this I can do this scripting the first step on our journey, though, is to understand why script. Okay, if, if I've done a few things at the command line, the PowerShell console, but now I want to go put things in a file and I want to record those lines so I can run them again later, why would I do that? I'm curious, what would you think? What are the benefits? What's that? Reusability. Reusability, repeatability, exactly. If I'm going to do something, it's going to take a while. I may as well script it so I can repeat it any time I want. Good one. What else? You always do the same thing. Okay. Do the same thing. Automate it. Okay, here's a few things that I came up with. Repeatables on the top of the list, survey says. All right. Number two is it eliminates human error. If I've got to change the IP address on 100 servers, what are the chances that I'm going to fat finger one of those IP addresses? All right. So it eliminates that human error. Unless, of course, as the scripter, you are the human error. Then you're really going to hurt yourself really fast. Okay? <laughs> uh, Jeffrey Snover compares PowerShell to a chainsaw. You've got to be really careful how you handle it. Right? Uh, also, change control logging. Ed Wilson mentioned this to me one day when I was teaching. He said, you know, if you've got a script, you can put that in your change control log. Here's everything that we did exactly. I wasn't you know, half asleep at 3 a.m., wiping sleep out of my eye and not sure what to click next. I actually had a script to implement that whole change. So the scripts can, imp can really help you in that respect. And it also helps you with going between test and production. So now I know that I ran the exact same steps in test and production because I've got a script to do both of those. It's huge time savings. You're going to, you know, especially... I. I had a customer a couple years ago. He had I do Active Directory, and he had a couple hundred Active Directory sites 
that were what we call empty sites without domain controllers. And we wanted to re-architect his site topology and roll all of those into a single site link and consolidate them. To do that, clicking in the GUI would take days. And we were able to do it in just a couple minutes with some PowerShell. So it's a huge time savings. And it's also just good job satisfaction. I mean, when you write some code and it works, you can go home for the day feeling like you really got something accomplished. Because you can come back in tomorrow and just run that same code and save all that time all over again. And there's a really good satisfaction that you get about it's that creative nature of humans, right? We want to build and create things. So that's part of that job satisfaction. So what I thought was let's look at PowerShell then in the scripting process. It's, every script starts with an idea, and we're going to talk about each one of these. Then from that idea, I have to find what commandlet is going to get me the data or make the change that I need. From there, I take that and I string it into a pipeline. So maybe I want to sort or filter or export that data. Then once I get those pipelines kind of built, kind of working, you know, stood up in the command shell, I'm going to take those and paste them then into the ISC and begin to build a script around that. And then once I've got my script kind of working, I've got the core functionality in there, then I'm going to take some of those pieces and put them in the functions that I can call over and over. And then once I've got that collection of functions developed, I can take those functions then and put them in a module that I can share with my team members so we can all use the same code at that point. And at that point, once you've kind of jumped each one of those hurdles, you will become the scripting hero in your department. You'll be the go-to scripter, the person that everybody says, yeah, go see him because he's going to help you with the script, right? And in your group, you're, you're either the one that's always given that guy requests or you are that guy writing the scripts, okay? You want to be that guy. It's good for your job, good for your career. So it always starts out with an idea or a need. And the thing I like to tell folks is if you're sitting there thinking, there's got to be a better way to do this, there probably is. And it very likely could include some PowerShell. So whenever you find yourself setting down to, auto, to do something in the GUI and you're thinking, this is going to take forever, that's when you stop and say, okay, the cost-benefit trade-off here, if I do this manually, it's going to take me a half hour. But if I take a half hour to write a script, then I don't have to spend that half hour every time I want to do this again. Exactly, much less error prone. We've got a good story about that. Yes, we do. So, uh, what are some things that you might want to automate? I always tell people to take your top five help desk calls. Whatever it is that you do when the help desk routes that ticket up to you, and all of a sudden you know you've got to go restart a service on a server or go put a file back in place, whatever it is, you know, repair something. Script that so you don't have to go actually click and do that every time. And then you can even get it to the place with a run as that the help desk can just fire it off and run it, and they don't call you anymore. So look at reducing your help desk call volume, for example. Now, your server build process and your QA, your checks, making sure that once the server's built that it's all configured the way you want, doing those checks afterwards. Monthly reporting. Um, guy just tell me, or was he telling me right before, we were talking right before, there, yeah, right before class we were talking about you know, automating these monthly reports, these weekly reports, checking mail database sizes and reporting on those, or you know, SQL databases, or free space, you know, and you have to run these kind of things, and for you know, years you RDP to the server, write down the numbers in a spreadsheet, put them all together and mail them to somebody, or post them somewhere. Now you can just do all that with PowerShell, right? You don't have to sit there and go to every box manually and do that. Okay, or, you need, hey, real practical, you need to count how many days remaining until Cyber Monday. Right, you can write a script for that. It doesn't have to be a big idea, it could be a small idea. After that, then, we, we know what we want to accomplish with PowerShell. Then we have to get in and actually find the commandlets. What, what's going to get me the data that I need? What's going to make the changes that I need? So there's this discovery process. And in that discovery process, I'm going to use get help, get command, and show command. Now, some of you might be thinking, show command? I've not heard of that one before. Well, that's new in PowerShell V3. 
and V4, you can type show command now, and it gives you a graphical commandlet browser where you can search for the right commandlet that you need and then fill in the blank for all the parameters and hit run. So it's a GUI that writes shell code. And that's new in PowerShell V3. I'd encourage you to check it out, show command. All right. So once we find the commandlets and we're getting the data back, then we need to look at it and say, which properties of that object that comes back do I need? Which methods? And for that, I can use things like get sim class. Get sim class is also new in PowerShell V3. And if you're still on Windows 7, you just go download the PowerShell V3 or PowerShell V4, install it off your Windows 7 box, and you're good to go. And you can use all these new features. So get sim class helps me search for WMI classes where I want to find the data, where it lives in WMI, for example. So I can say get sim class star disk star. And it'll show me all the data classes related to disk information, for example. Um, piping things to get member or format list star so I can see all the properties associated with that object and all the methods. So I know then what do I sort on when I, what do I type when I want to sort on something? Get member will tell me or format list star will tell me. If I want to um, put a where condition and filter on something or sort, I'm going to use get member or format list star to find those, <coughs> excuse me, those properties. After that, then we string these things into a pipeline. And so what happens with a pipeline is the output from the left becomes input to the right. So if I say get service, where status is equal to running, that's going to filter now all those services coming through the pipeline that we're going to line wrap, <coughs> then sort that by the name, and then pipe that to an out grid view. Some of you know me, that's my favorite commandlet, out grid view. You can put it in this great sortable little filterable GUI instead of all those wrapping lines at the console, okay? Here's, I want to get a list of servers. All right, all right, hold on, don't look at that real quick. All right. Um, so how many lines of VB script would it have taken to get a list of servers from a text file to go query all the hotfix and patches that have been installed on all those servers and then dump that out to a spreadsheet with all kinds of formatting around it, right? Hundreds of lines. Now in PowerShell, we can do that in one wrapped line of code. We can do a get content on a list of servers in a text file. We pipe that to for each get hotfix on that computer and then export it to a CSV in one stinking line of code. That's the power of the pipeline in PowerShell. That's amazing. We couldn't do that before because I, I did VB script for 12 years before I did PowerShell. And let me tell you, this is so much easier, okay? So there's a help topic called About Pipelines. So if you type get-help space about underscore pipelines, it'll tell you how to use those in your code. Yes? What would the, the content on the server.txt look like? It just it's just a text file. Name and then enter server name yeah. And Yep, just a wrapped list of server names. Yep. Next after that. I got yeah. a quick question on okay. the What is the best way to know exactly what is passing over? I've run into a couple of times where when it passes over it's not exactly what I expected. Like the formatting is different than what is expected. Okay. For the next value. So there are a couple things you can use there. Get member that we looked at earlier. Uh, get member and format list star, those are two. But the one thing that you want to be careful with pipelines is never put a format list or format table in the middle. That's the fastest way to kill a pipeline because it's designed to go at the very end of the pipe and format the output for the screen. So along those lines, you want to be careful that you don't put your formatting in the middle. I always follow the old school you know, input process output. I've got some type of a get command in the beginning of the pipeline. In the middle, I've got some kind of process, a filter, a sort. At the end, I've got an output, whether it's uh, you know, out grid view or export CSV. So input, process, output when you're building those pipelines. Right, so next after that, we've got some, we've been tinkering in the console. We found the commandlets and parameters that we want. And then we go, we build some pipelines. Now we want to take that and create a script file. So what we're going to do from the console, we type ISE, and it's going to launch this really slick graphical editor for our scripts that's free and out of the box. Okay, And now with uh, ISE v3 and v4, 
The IntelliSense is phenomenal. It's the most amazing scripting experience now. It's not like Notepad. All right, that's a long time ago. So it's very easy now to edit your scripts in the IFC. And we can add parameters to those scripts so where they expect, like, like a commandlet, you put a dash and a parameter name. You can do that with your scripts as well to pass in different parameters to them. And you just save those all on a PS1 file, and then you can run it again anytime you need to call it. And the cool thing about that is then I can just run it, or I can actually take that script file and use remoting in PowerShell, like invoke command, and pass it over the wire and run it on another machine using invoke command. I can use it as a scheduled task, as a login script. Lots of things I can do there with those uh, script files. And more about that is under Get Help About Scripts. So as we're building this and it's getting bigger and it's taking on a life of its own now, we've got a script. We've got some things we're doing in that script. We want to create some functions. And I remember when I was taking uh, Freshman Pascal 4.4. Uh, that might date me a little bit. And my, uh, my professor said, this is spaghetti code. So I, I was first introduced to that term spaghetti code as a freshman in college because the, thing that, the things that I was doing in code when I taught myself weren't quite right, I suppose, as a kid. So uh, in other words, you, you want to take that spaghetti code and kind of sort it out, find those key uh, pieces of the script that really does the heavy lifting, and convert that into a function. So now I can call that function and pass in my parameters and get that result every time. It's a beautiful thing. And so you take those, and this is where I, that's where I learned, uh, actually later I took a C++ class uh, several years later, and uh, we talked about atomic functions. So I mean, in other words, that function should really only do one thing. It shouldn't be 300 lines long for a function. A function should just be a few lines of logic and things to get exactly what you need in there. Okay, And you can put parameters in those. And this gets really easy now in PowerShell v3 in the ISE, PowerShell v4. All I do is hit Control-J in the ISE, and it says, what do you want to insert in your code right here? A function, uh, an if, a do while. It automatically puts those snippets in there for you. And it pre-types them. Great way to save some time on your scripting. And there's help built in about functions here, about underscore functions, about functions advanced. And so, for example, uh, a good example of a function uh, we're going to try here in a little bit when we have some time. Let's say I want to prompt the user to give me a computer name, and then I want to go grab some data from that computer. But, the, but you know, the, whoever the user is, and maybe they're challenged with the keyboard, and they're not expecting them to type that computer name correctly every time. So what you want to do is you want to get a valid computer name from the user. So in your little function, you say, I'm going to get the computer name from the user, and then I'm going to check it to make sure that computer is actually on and talking to me. And if not, I'm going to prompt them for another computer name again and let them type it until I get a valid computer name. That's an example of a simple routine that you put into a function and you just call it anytime you need a valid computer name from the user. Again, just a simple example. So once we've gotten our functions built up, uh, we call it sometimes a function library. We've got a lot of code there. We're starting to get several of these functions that you know we can reuse our own code. Instead of copy and pasting somebody's code off the internet, now we're copy and pasting our own code and start putting these functions together and building our scripts. Well, now instead of uh, copying and pasting those all the time, we can take those and put them into a module. And a module is just a collection of functions. It looks like get-service or get-process that we normally type that look like commandlets. We can make our own commandlets, and those are our function names. So we put those in a file called a PSM1, <coughs> and then we can specify some metadata around it like version and author and company name and that kind of stuff. Uh, in a manifest file. Now you can share those, and it makes it a portable code library. So here's my module. Just import it, and you've got all my functions that I use. And now I can put that on a share, and the team can use that code, and we can all share it. And that way we know we're running the same code. It's not Joe's version of the routine. It's the standard team version of that routine. Uh, in uh, FCCM 2012, you import the FCCM module into the 32-bit ISE. 
and you have to do it that way because I guess the 64-bit ISC isn't supported or doesn't work, and that doesn't make sense to me why a 32-bit module wouldn't work in the 64-bit ISC. Does that sound familiar to you at all? I've not worked with it. Okay. But what I can say, for example, with the Office COM objects, COM is a 32-bit technology. It's not ported to 64, and so in those examples, you have to always use the 32-bit version of PowerShell. So there are some legacy code uh, <coughs> calls maybe in there somewhere that would force you to use the 32-bit. That makes sense yeah. based on when SMS came out yeah. 15 years ago. Right. Okay. Yep. So these modules then are a great, great way to collect large bodies of code then that you've built up over time. You can share them with your team and you can use them yourself now instead of rewriting that function, you've already got it there in a module, you import the module, you run that code all day long. Okay? And there's, an, again, more help about underscore modules. And you can create those modules for any kind of you know, collection of code. For example, let's say you've got <coughs> the top five help desk solution scripts and you just bundle that into a module and give it to the help desk to import. They run the module, they run the commands and they're good. Okay? Or maybe you've got all your reporting. You've got a, a weekly and monthly reports like we just talked about. You know, it's great to be able to run those reports and that it makes you look like you're being very productive on 3 p.m. on Friday afternoon when really it's a scheduled task that's already set to go grab that data and email it to your boss so he doesn't know that you're really gaming at home. Okay. So that's the uh, module. So we kind of go through this progression now. And what I want to do is I want us to spend the rest of the session. Let's see. We've got, what, about a half an hour? Good. If you have a laptop, you're welcome to pull it out and use it. And what I want to do is just kind of talk through this whole discovery process with this case study example. I've got a request that somebody's come to me and they say they, they need a script that's going to find the uptime for my servers and the last date a patch was applied to that server. It's kind of an everyday kind of request, okay? not too complicated. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to actually walk through this and script this out together in the session. And I want, I want your feedback and input as we go through this. I want this to be interactive. So I'm going to pull up the shell, and we're just going to kind of walk through this 101 scripting process. How do I go from an idea to a script that's actually going to be fully mature and it's going to have uh, all the error handling and logic uh, that I need to grab this. So uh, now what we're going to do is flip back over to the ISE. If I can find my pointer here. Here we are. And on this particular VM, I have a Windows 7 machine with PowerShell version 3 installed. Okay, It's free download. You go out there and look for the Windows Management Framework 3. And now, actually, version 4 is released since 2012 R2 is out. You can go download that, install it, use the latest code on your Windows 7 machine. I'm using the ISE here in the uh, console pane. And when I drop down the script pane at the top, you can see I've got all my demo scripts all loaded up there. But the thing I like about this new ISE now is if I start typing, uh, I'm going to use, I'm going to get into the right folder here, and into my dog food folder. There we go. There's my files. Okay. So uh, what I want you to see is that this ISE console now has IntelliSense built in. So it's almost like having the PowerShell command prompt, okay, but you've got IntelliSense on top of it. So if I type, for example, get dash, oh wow, look at that, it's popping up as I type, get dash, look at that, there's all the syntax all popping up at a glance. So for a beginning scripter, it's going to time out in a second, but for a beginning scripter, this is a great way to learn PowerShell. Pull up the ISC, just take that command pane at the bottom, make it full screen, and as you're typing, it's going to suggest things that you're probably trying to get to. So if I type get process here, and I hit tab complete there, okay, and now I say dash, I put the dash, and all my parameters come up, I hit dash in tab, I never type anything completely in PowerShell, tab key every other stroke, right, space, look at this, 
Now all of a sudden, get process dash name. It is actually looking at all the processes running on the machine and giving me a list of all the processes that I might want to grab. Okay. So this is the kind of rich intelligence that you have built in now in the ISC. It works both in the command pane and in the script pane. So our problem is, though, we need to find uptime. How would I go about finding uptime for a server and from, a, from a scripting standpoint? Got, got any ideas? Get, like get object computer dot uptime or something? Yeah, if there were some computer object that just had uptime on it, yeah. that would be really clever, but there's not. I think the other way is to check what, how long the network card's been up. How long the network card's been up? Hmm, what else? If your read is stored in WMI, if you read it in WMI and... Okay, look for it in WMI. That's a good place to find that kind of data. What else? I was just to, uh, on the computer itself, get all the properties, you should all the properties, and there's not five properties there. Is there? Where is that? Where is it located? In the computer properties. Just to run your filter style computer properties. And what's the first commandlet that gets that to me? Do you remember? Get computer. Okay, I've got some other hands over here. What some other ideas? System info. System info. Hey, yeah. And you know what system info does on the back end is it just calls you know half a dozen different WMI classes to pull all that data in, right? So and it has CSV output. That's a really handy thing with system info. You can get a slash CSV on there for the format. You can actually work with that. Uh, but I want to follow this WMI path, and because obviously I know where this is going to end up, right? So uh, let's think about uh, one way to calculate uptime would be if I knew what time my system booted, I could subtract that date time value from the current date time to get the difference, which would be elapsed time since the machine booted, which would be uptime. Okay? So that's the path we're going to take today to find uptime. Now the problem is, though, I've got to find where in WMI does boot time exist? Well, there's a new commandlet in V3 called get sim class. Get dash sim class, okay? And get sim class is like get WMI object from PowerShell V2, except it's got superpowers. All right, it's better. It's just we'll just leave it at that. And in get WMI object, I could say dash list, and it would show me all thousands of the WMI classes. Now what I want to look for, though, is I want to look for a property name somewhere in WMI that has boot in it, boot time, okay? So I'm going to say get some class dash p property name, tab complete there, star boot star. <coughs> and it takes it a minute to go look through all the thousands of WMI classes, and it's going to come back and say, these are all the classes that have a parameter or property with boot in the name. So I'm going to guess it's going to be maybe a boot configuration. No, probably not that. How about a computer system? Yeah, that could be it. Uh, maybe operating system. So it's probably going to be between computer system or operating system. So I'm going to say uh, get sim class win32 computer system. Oh, and by the way, tab complete in version 3 on WMI class names, because those are always the longest things to type. So it just gives me, uh, I've got the class there. Uh, actually, what I want to do is uh, do instead, whoops, get sim instance. That's actually going to get the data. And so we were doing win32 underscore computer system. All right. There it is. And I'm going to pipe that now. What would I use to see all the properties from that WMI class? FL, FL format list, star. Okay. What's another one? <laughs> Out grid view would only give me the properties from the default format there. Get number. Get number will also give me all those properties. 
So in this case, I'm going to use format list star, and I'm, I usually abbreviate that to FL star. And that's going to give me uh, some stuff here. And what I'm looking for is something with boot in the name. Let me know if you see it. Oh, look, there it is. Boot option, boot on watch. Boot option on watchdog, what is that? Uh, boot, so that's not boot time. Uh, so that's a, that's a strike right there. We didn't we didn't find it that time. The other one we found. What was? You remember what it was? Yeah, Win32 underscore operating system. And again, I'm going to pipe that out to an FL star format list star. And now, if we what does the star do? It says, it says, give me every single property you've got. Doesn't FL just do that? No, not necessarily. <laughs> it's going to give me all the properties, but not all of them. It's just going to give me the default ones. So does anybody see anything about boot time in here? Uh, there's boot device. Do we see it anywhere? Uh, let's see. Last boot up time. There it is. Okay. Last boot up time. So now what I want to do is let's say uh, get sim instance win32 operating system dash property last. Let's see if it'll no tab complete there. Boot up time. And it gives me all those again. So rather than searching for lists, is there like the equivalent of typing that into a graph or something? Is it the equivalent of that? Or you can type that out put into a search or something? Sure. You can. There's a, oh, what's the, uh, you can use select, but there's another commandlet. It's a search. Oh, I, I don't remember off the top of my head. Let's tell you what. How, okay, let's, let's figure it out. Let's do this real quick. Show command. And I'm going to run that. And I want to do something with search. And no command let's come up with search in the name. There was uh, I just did this the other day. Uh, yeah, find is an alias, maybe. <coughs> anyway, I have to get back to you on that one. So, so what we've got then is we found the WMI class that has the last boot up time in it. So now we need to snag that last boot up time and subtract it from the current date and time. And so this is kind of the scripting discovery process. I don't know the answer when I start. I have to go find it. I have to go find where that data lives. And I have to find the right properties associated with it. So now what we want to do is come in and find... Uh, so I've got the last boot up time. How can I get today's date in PowerShell? Get dash date. Get dash date. Now, the way I can find that is if I do show command and I want to find a commandlet related to dates, I just put in date and there it is. There's get date and that'll give me today's date. Hmm. Uh, also, I could click this little question mark right here and it's going to give me the full help on get date. I'm going to scroll this up now. This is part of a new command, that, uh, a new parameter to, sh to get dash help has a show window parameter now. Makes it real easy to view this instead of scrolling through all those pages. And I'm going to save us a little time. I'm going to tell you right down through here. Uh, yes, get date will give me the current date and time. But how will I find the difference between two dates? That's a little different. So if I scroll down all the way to the bottom of this help topic. I'm looking for a way to calculate the difference between dates. And if I look at examples here, it's not really being helpful. I want to get all the way to the bottom. It says, hey, related information. There's a command called new dash time span. That's the one that Lao Tzu wrote in the 4th century BC, right? <laughs> So now what we're going to do is we're going to go use this new time span and see what that does. So I'm going to come up here now in my show command and say time span. There it is. And I'm going to look at the help on it. And it says, hey, look at this. <coughs> Creates a new time span object representing a time interval. 
And you can use a time span to subtract time from date time objects. And so we look down here, we've got days, hours, minutes, seconds, start and end times. And if we scroll down to the examples, because that's where most of us don't read all those parameters. We go straight to the examples, right? Show me how to do it, okay? So down in here, we'll see a new time span dash end and then a get date. That'll give us today's date. And we can keep looking through these examples. And uh, so here, let's let's come back out now. We've we found the commandlet that we need. So what we need to do then is we need to capture that last boot time into a variable. So we're going to say, let's say dollar boot equals, and that was uh, get sim instance when 32 underscore operating system and Real, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cheat here, and I'm going to go ahead and put this in parentheses and to show you how we can do this. I'm going to dot. What I do is I put all that parentheses, and I'm going to get just that last boot up time property off of here. So I'm going to say uh, dot last boot up time. And if I did that right, now dollar boot. Hey, there it is. Okay. So now I've got a variable that contains the last boot up time. Now, I, I kind of skimmed through that new time span help very quickly. In new time span, if you give it a date as a parameter, it will automatically return for you how long it is between today's date and that date. So I'm going to say uh, new dash time span dollar boot. Oh, wow. It was total days of 0 0.02877668439236116 days ago that this machine booted. All right, our total hours, we got 0 0.6 hours, 41 minutes, milliseconds, and so forth. So now, not only can I tell how long it's been up, I can tell you that in milliseconds, seconds, days, hours, any particular property that I want on this time span object. So let's say that if we run this line again, uh, say dollar uptime equals, and we're going to put this in parentheses again, say dot uh, total hours. So now I've got a variable called dollar uptime that says 0.7 hours total uptime since that machine booted. Pretty cool. What do you think? Okay. Is this helpful? Okay. So we we talk about because uh, I I teach PowerShell every day and I do a lot of these presentations at conferences and we we're talking like way up here sometimes. I want to bring this session way down to say how do I write a script? You know, this is the process. And uh, even Jeffrey Snover, the guy who invented PowerShell for Microsoft, he will tell you that he uses get dash help every day when he sits down to write a script. Okay? I have been doing PowerShell for three or four years now. I use get dash help every day when I'm writing a script. A get command, get help, get member. We use these things over and over. So I want to kind of pop that bubble that you know that people who are really expert scripters never use help. That's not true. Everybody uses help when they sit down to write a script. Get command and get help. You've got to know where to start. Okay? So now we've gone through the discovery process of finding where the data lives. You know, we started out with this idea of how do I get uptime. Then we went through and we said, okay, well, that's probably going to live in WMI somewhere. And then we used get sim class to find where that was in WMI. Now we've used get help to find a command that there's going to difference two dates for us. So this is kind of the whole scripting process. It's this discovery over and over. What do I need and where do I get it? How do I make that work in PowerShell? And we just repeat that over and over.
And that's really that genesis of the script where you're getting that core functionality together to figure out how it's going to work. Okay. Questions? Yes? Yeah, um, I write a lot of scripts, and I wind up just sticking them in, like, .ps1. Okay. Um, I would like to see maybe an example where you could show us, like, how you take this down and put it into a, a module or into a... Um, yeah, into a function and into a module. I mean, do you have something a script already that has that in you could show us? Or? Well, I kind of wrote the session, so I've got all this already written. Oh, okay. All right. And it's all in the download. So I've got a full blown thing where it goes from the command lines, discovering the commandlets, writing the scripts, building the functions. And that's about where I quit because there's, we could spend about four hours in this session if I really wanted to go as far as you know we could. But just to show you, uh, we'll kind of peel back the curtain here. And look, it's been waiting right here all along, OK? So demo one, and these are the scripts that you can download. I'll put these out on my blog next week. Kind of goes through this whole process of discovering. And in that case, I use get my object instead. It's a little bit more convoluted than the get sim instance, but it does the same thing, getting the last boot time and doing the time span. And then uh, the next is how to get hotfix information. And I don't, I don't want to cheat and show you that yet. All right. So then what we do is we come over here to demo two, and we put this all in a, a little script file. So we take these lines. So uh, read host is how we get input from the user. And then I'm going to do that read host until I can successfully execute a WMI query against the computer name that they gave me. All right. So it's going to prompt you over and over. Enter the name of the machine to target. A B A S D F. Uh, no. All right. Enter the name of the machine to target. Then what it's going to do is going to go out to WMI, and it's going to grab from that computer the operating system object we just looked like looked at. It's going to convert that uh, to a date time for last boot up time. It's going to print that out, and then it's going to grab the hotfix information. And we could probably skip over the hotfix information here. Just to, so so now if I run this script, hit F5 here. And it says down there at the bottom, enter the name of the machine to target. And I put in foo. It's going to think for a second. It's going to try to find foo. And there is no such thing as foo. It's going to time out and says, nope, enter the name of the machine to target. ASDF, right? Let's try that one. Nope, that's not a good machine name either. It's going to time out until I put in a valid machine name. I've got a CVDC1 machine. And then all of a sudden my script comes back and says, hey, the uptime is 0 .03 days, and it was last patched on 10.24. If you want to take <coughs> the machine is on, is that the fastest way to do it, or can you ping it or something like that to find the machine? There are a number of ways to check to see if it's on. Uh, you can try to ping it. And traditional ping uses ICMP packets, which are blocked by a lot of firewalls. Mm -hmm. So that may not be good. Uh, in PowerShell, in the demo scripts, you can download and kind of go through this step by step. We look at the test dash connection commandlet. Test connection is the WMI version of ping. Actually, there's a, a Win32 ping. Uh, I don't know if that's the exact name, but basically it does a ping over WMI. So that tests test a different connectivity method. You can also just do a straight up WMI query. You can try to do a PS session for remoting. So there are a number of ways to check whether or not that machine is up and online. But if you have a lot of machines, what would you consider one of the fastest ways to check? If I were to do this for a thousand machines, um, I probably would code it a little differently. I wouldn't do a, I wouldn't do a check first. I would just let my first check fail, and, and instead of doing two checks, I would do one, and then if it failed, I would handle that error and and go back to the beginning of the loop. Um, so uh, we've got a script here then. I'm going to run this one again. So now I've got a script that says enter the name of the target machine. Let's do CV member one this time. And it's been up on 0 .03 days. And it was also patched last on October 24th. And the way we're doing the patching is using get hotfix. Get dash hotfix. And we're going to create a little pipeline with that. Let me scoot back to the previous demo here. 
uh, get hotfix down the list here. So if I type get help star patch star, I want to see when it was last patched, okay? Uh, I run that line, get help for star patch star. Is there any help topic that has the word patch in it? And eh, not really. All right, so that was a bust. How do I find the name of that command? Let, let's try something else. Let's run uh, get help star hotfix star because I know that's kind of a synonym for a patch. Sure enough, now I've found a commandlet called get hotfix. And I see that get hotfix has a computer name parameter. So I can just call that commandlet and give it a computer and it'll go get the hotfixes. That's going to bring back a list of all the hotfixes on that machine. So for this particular machine, uh, if I type get hotfix, it's going to bring back the date and the patch and who installed it on the machine name here. So I've got all that and <coughs> was it a security or just a regular hotfix? So the <coughs> excuse me. So then I pipe that into a uh, pipeline down here that says sort by the installed on date. That's the property at the top of the column. And then I can say select object the last one. I pipe it again. An, an alternate way of doing that is just looking at the negative one index on the array, which always gets the last one in the array. And so when it all comes down, then right here, I can say, give me the installed on date of the last hotfix that was installed. And when I run that, then I, it's going to come back with the date of the last hotfix that was installed. Now, um, we are really short on time. We got a late start due to some technical difficulties. I want to kind of cut to the finish here. So what I've done then is in these scripts I provided for you to download today, I built up each version. I've got eight files. Each one kind of builds on the previous one so you can watch the evolution of how a script unfolds and grows. And then here I've got now a function called get-computerName. And that function does what we just saw. It keeps prompting for a computer until it gets a valid one. And then it returns the name of that computer. Here's a function called get-uptime. And I added a parameter called units. And I can specify either days or hours. What units do I want the uptime in? And it will return them that way. Coming on down, get-last patch with a parameter of computer name. So I've taken that little one line of code now put it in a function for get last patch and then at the very end I've created a report array here and so for each target in my list of servers dot text I'm going to go out and if I can get a WMI command to run successfully then I'm going to append the server name the uptime and the patch date to my report my output if I can't get a response from it, I'm going to put in an entry that says offline. I'm going to, for each one, I'm going to go hit that machine, query those two properties, put them into a custom object, and by the end, I've got a report here that I can export to a CSV. So <clears throat> I knew we wouldn't have enough time to cover all this in an hour, and I, I knew that, so I wanted to go ahead and just kind of flesh this out for you. So you now have a kind of a starter script to get you going and do something similar in your environment. Whether it's uptime or not, you can use the techniques in these scripts as a template to kind of build from. So my goal today was to cover the scripting process and how we go from copy and paste scripting to uh, I can do this scripting. So the scripting process then starts out with an idea. I need something. I've got to get something done. A request comes in. I've got to go find the commandlets. What are the commandlets, the parameters? What properties am I going to get for that data? I build that into a pipeline. Then I take those pipelines and I add them into a script file. Those scripts then I can bust into separate functions. Then those functions will go into modules. And at the end of the day, the end of the week, the end of the month, after I've done this enough times, I've helped enough people, I will become the scripting hero in my department. Okay, and that's where we want to be. Now, uh, I threw in one extra slide to talk about the scripting life cycle. 
kind of put it into three phases. And, and I'll preface this by saying I know other PowerShell MVPs have written books on the scripting process and how to do that, and I recommend those uh, books. Now, this is all based on my own personal observations after years of scripting, so I'm not copying from anything that they've done, but it might look the same. I don't know. I've not read their books. So phase one is write, test, debug. Write, test, debug. Write, test, debug. Get that core functionality. Find the commandlet. Find the parameter. Get the property. Get that core data coming back. And then you kind of build around that. So phase two is making it friendly. If you write scripts without any comments in them, it's not... Yeah, it'll make you the go-to person, but after a while, you want people to kind of service themselves. So put some comments in there so people can edit your scripts and know what you're doing with it, okay? And when you use that Control-J shortcut in the ISC, there's some templated, in, it's called the comment-based help that'll help you annotate those scripts. You add some error handling, some logging, because we live in a messy world. Those machines might be offline. You've got to put some error handling in there to see what happens. What do I do when it's offline? Add some logging. <clears throat> Drop it out in a report at the end like we did. And finally, phase three is when you release that script. You've tested it. You feel pretty good about it. All the use cases that you can think of, you tested different error conditions. You've got it good. You publish it. Then it's sure enough, like anything else in the world of software, there's got to be updates, right? You think you've got it right. Then you get some feedback from some other folks on the team that says, oh, there's this one scenario. It doesn't work too hot. So you go back and fix it. You've got some version control. You have to support your scripts. If there's one thing I've learned in all the years of scripting and coding is that they know where they got the script, and they're going to come back to you with questions. Okay, That's why you put good comments in there. All right, so that's kind of the scripting life cycle as an overview. And lastly, I want to point you to some resources because this is an intro scripting session today. I wanted to give you some very uh, basic intro uh, resources where you can go learn more. Uh, number one, I'm going to publish these slides and scripts out on my blog next week so you can go get those as a starting point. Number two, Microsoft Virtual Academy. How many have been to that website? Okay, good. Have you watched the PowerShell jumpstart out there? You want to go find this. Jeffrey Snover, the man himself who invented PowerShell, he's got a full eight, seven or eight hours teaching PowerShell for free on video with Jason Helmick, who's an MVP in PowerShell as well. That's called Get Started with PowerShell 3 Jumpstart. Then those same guys did another free full day of training called Advanced Tools and Scripting with PowerShell 3 Jumpstart. Go find those out on Microsoft Virtual Academy and watch them. Very good free training for you to get started scripting with PowerShell. Also, Ed Wilson, the Microsoft scripting guy, he's a buddy of mine. And this guy's written more books than you can count. Uh, two that I would recommend for beginners would be uh, PowerShell First Steps. And when is PowerShell Step by Step? You can find both of those anywhere you find technical books even Kindle versions and so forth. So I would really recommend those books as resources uh, to get you started. All right, I realize we're a couple minutes over time, and we'll go ahead and uh, ask for a last call for any questions. Yes? We have a hybrid environment. Some are Macintosh and some are Windows machines. Is there any support for, like, reading in, you know, for example, with the GetWMI, is there any way you could get that kind of information out of, um, you know, OSX or Macintosh machines? <laughs> I'm glad you asked. Uh, yes and no. There's the SIM commandlets. Uh, that's where they're headed. SIM is an industry standard for that WMI type data. Now, SIM is actually the industry standard that WMI is based on. So there are some open source libraries that have that kind of information. Uh, unfortunately, the story isn't complete yet. There's not that flexible, it's called uh, WSMAN, Web Services Management Protocol, that we get that SIM data from those machines. The groundwork is laid in there. Microsoft has implemented it. The other side hasn't implemented it so much yet. Uh, there's something called OMI, Open Management Instrumentation. It's an uh, open source project to get this type of functionality into the Unix and Linux environment. Uh, some other hardware vendors and third parties 
have implemented things like in Cisco and uh, some of these other network gear type companies. There's there's some other places. Dell's done some of it where you got PowerShell to manage different things, but there's not a complete story there yet. We've done it on our side, coming to that industry standard. The other people haven't met us there yet. Yeah. Although, if you go back to TechEd 2012 and look for a Jeffrey Snover presentation on PowerShell and Windows Server standards and interoperability, they do this demo that they cooked up where they actually do an interoperability with a, a Linux box and a Windows box on PowerShell. But it took a lot to make that happen because all the plumbing's not there and they had to do a lot of code on the other side. We've got the code, the other side's not quite there yet. Good question. All right. So uh, that wraps us up for today. Thank you for staying out for the last session. And if you have any questions, you can contact me through my blog. It has my email as a contact the blog author out there and or hit me up on Twitter. And thank you very much.